So thank you for having me first. Um, I would also like to thank all the sponsors that are making this conference possible. Um, I saw some of the other sessions before and I think this is just a great day. So thank you to the sponsors. Thank you to the Scottish Summit for having me. Uh, this is really a great day. Um, so this is me. Um, I'm a DevOps engineer based in Italy. I'm working in a company called iCubed, uh, again, here in Milan. And today I'm going to talk you, to you about uh, how to make your managers happy using Azure DevOps. Uh, I know this is a huge uh, and bold statement, uh, but um, we'll see what we can do. I will tell you my story on how I made my managers happy, but uh, of course I will be sharing some of the tips and tricks that I learned uh, in my uh, experience in the past three months, uh, sorry, three years working on that project. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to use the same on, uh, on your team as well. Um, so first of all, I think we need to clarify exactly who is a manager and uh, because usually we think of managers uh, about people that are wearing suits and ties, but actually this is not entirely true because if you look at the dictionary, um, you take the word manager, you will say something like whomever can administer and hold responsibility with decision-making powers onto something. Um, and this is really important because if we look at Azure DevOps, for example, into the product, into the team that you, that you have, um, you will see that you have different managers. Uh, there are not only CEOs and CTOs or something like that. Um, but you also have, for example, the Scrum Master and the PO that are responsible for the backlog. I know that this is not 100% true maybe um, because it's not Scrum Master responsibility to really uh, look at the backlog and do uh, this kind of thing. But let's assume it is just for the sake of the presentation. Um, and then you have a development team, which is responsible for development. And then you have program manager, product manager, and higher and higher, um, which are responsible for the product itself, for the delivery of the product, and so on and so forth. Uh, so in your team, you will already have different levels of management. Again, development team is some kind of manager by itself. So I know it, it is quite strange, but it is. Um, before digging into the presentation first, I would like to tell you uh, a really sad story, um, which is why I started doing DevOps in this specific project, because I started three years ago um, on, uh, on this team. Uh, where we said, okay, we need to do a POC, a proof of concept on something. And there were just five people in the team working on that. It was more or less a web API project based on .NET framework. You may remember that from uh, very old days. And then we were simply building and releasing from Visual Studio to an Azure app service. Uh, of course, there were no tests because we were just doing a proof of concept. Everything was working in my machine. Um, but then someday, um, some of the highest manager we had sold the product to one of the customers and we were told to go in production. And this is what happened. Uh, I apologize, the uh, screenshot is quite blurred, but this is an actual screenshot coming from production back from three years ago. Um, so if you look at that, probably you will not be able to see the numbers, but actually the number of crashes were skyrocketing. Um, so we said, okay, we, we, we just deployed into production and we have number of crashes that are way higher than uh, the number of uh, requests that are successful. So what is going on? Um, so we started debugging because this is what we do as developers mainly. So um, I said, okay, uh, let's look first at the configuration in Azure. So we looked at the app service. Um, we noticed that the app service um, had an unrestricted FTP access. So this was strange. Anybody could have gone there and delete everything. 
but the application, most importantly, was compiled in the bug because we noticed some files that were compiled only uh, and were present there only because it was compiled in debug mode. So we said, okay, this is quite strange. It shouldn't have happened, but you know, this is not necessarily the, the reason why this is failing. Uh, so we looked at the second attempt. Um, we said, okay, let's try to download all the DLLs that we published. Let's try to retrieve the build number. And then uh, from, from that, uh, let's try to trace it in the Git history, uh, given the Git tag and the Git commit and so on, and try to reproduce it locally. Um, I apologize, the screenshot is in Italian, but again, this is a real screenshot from back then. Um, but I think you can all recognize that when we right clicked on the DLL, we noticed that the version was set to 1.0.0. And it, it wasn't really strange. Back then, we didn't have any versioning. Um, so this was another interesting point that we'll, uh, we will try to address later in the presentation. Uh, but the most important thing is that we did it again to work on that, to try to resolve all the issues and understand what was going on. So we started using some tools to disassemble all the DLLs and try to really look at the code. And we researched 100 commits or even more. Um, and then after seven business days, we were back in production with a newer version that was working. Um, and you know what happened? The thing is that we were sending so many emails regarding go to prod, go to prod, go to prod, but actually nobody really clicked at the button to go into production. So what we had in production was a previous version. Um, uh, I think it was three or four months old um, so that it wasn't what we were supposed to ship. And I think this proves also that this meme here is wrong because it says that you can't have production errors if you never ship. But actually, we did. So this is wrong. Uh, I hope you get the joke. Um, so we said, OK, we need to do something about this one. Uh, this can never happen again in the future. Um, and we said, we probably need to start introducing DevOps in our team. And we needed to first understand what DevOps was about and all these things. Um, so we started from the definition of DevOps. So here is a quote from Donovan Brown from Microsoft, where he says that DevOps is the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to your end users. And I think this is really important and really summarize what DevOps is really about. And as you can see, people are in the first place of this picture. And then you have process, and then you have products, but there are no tools. I think in this session, just to simplify a, a little bit all the things, I will be talking a lot about tools because I'm talking about Azure DevOps. Uh, but you will see in a moment that most of the things are related to people not really uh, working the way we expect to, let me say. Um, so at that time, we looked at some of the reports just to justify the change to DevOps. And there were these uh, dollar reports saying, hey, you will have 45, uh, 46 times deployment frequency, faster time to market, increased revenue, and all these things that uh, made uh, managers really think that DevOps was a good thing and we needed to start introducing it. Uh, and then we got back uh, an answer from managers and they said, okay, you need to do it. Uh, I got in touch with the development team. We sit down and we said, okay, where do we start? We identified some set of practices. These are some of the things that we have in place already today uh, because we did a lot in the past three years. We are not, I would say, 100% done yet and probably we will never be because there are a lot of good practices that uh, uh, are evolving and are getting introduced every single day and really depends on the product that you're building. But we said, given we need to start from scratch, let's start from the basics. Let's start doing a continuous integration and continuous deployment pipeline and then do really the entire product management, the release management process and stuff like that. So we said, let's try to create a pipeline that builds the product um, the same way Visual Studio is doing and then publish the package of the application into the app service so that we have full traceability of the entire work that we are doing. 
and hopefully this will not happen again in the future. Uh, but of course, there are many other areas we need to invest, and I think we will be touching many of these things uh, in the, the next slides. So just to mention something, configuration management regarding infrastructure as code, testing and monitoring. I will be talking a lot about testing in production, uh, fault injection, monitoring, and so on uh, later in the presentation. So I will uh, we will see that. Um, and again, before uh, sharing some tips and tricks, I would like to show you where we are now. Uh, so we have um, actually the project grew um, pretty quickly. Uh, so from five team members, we immediately went to 13, like less than a month. And then from there, uh, we are now more or less 17 team members. Uh, that includes real management, people wearing suits. <laughs> And we are based in three locations and in two different time zones. And we actually have four different teams doing different kind of uh, applications, different part of the application. So we have a team dedicated to mobile, one team dedicated to the front end, one to the back end, and so on. Uh, and then based on all the practices that you just saw, we are now able to do 60 deployments per day. And we do, I would say, 40,000 tests per day, which is a really good number considering that we started from nothing. Uh, and then the remaining are just numbers, but we really don't care about how many pull requests we are able to merge and so on. Um, again, another piece of the cake just to um, give you the context on where we started. Um, so taking a step back and looking at the definition of DevOps uh, from, from Donovan Brown. Um, we need to look at the picture and say, people, process, and tools. Um, what do we do? Well, if you start from the tools, these are the easiest part for sure. Uh, because right now, for example, if you think about Docker or any other tool, uh, you pull in a container, you use it, you don't need it anymore, so you throw it away. Uh, and the same way it works for tools. You use a tool, you don't need it anymore, you can replace it. There are all technical people, so I think this is the easiest part. You just learn how to read the documentation um, and then everything can be set up uh, pretty, pretty easily. Um, people, though, are the most complicated part. Um, I think you can get the joke from uh, that image over there, but uh, the most difficult thing regarding people is that it's hard to change mindset. If I am used to do always the same thing, it's hard to change the mindset and do continuous delivery, uh, think about delivering always in production and stuff like that. Uh, so this is quite complicated. And process? Well, this is complicated as well because it involves people, but it involves management as well. And it is somehow um, related to tools as well. So. Yeah, it's tricky because you have many moving parts that you need to connect. And then we decided, OK, we need to start somewhere. So what do we do? Which tool do we use? Um, we said, OK, we are doing some Microsoft-based development. We are using .NET. We are developing uh, and releasing in Azure using app services. So we want a centralized place where we have our backlog, where we have our CI CD system, where we host our code, and so on. And then the choice was quite obvious, so we decided to go directly with Azure DevOps. Um, OK, so I think you now have the entire context on why we needed to do this uh, thing. and. Now I will tell you a little bit of what we actually did to make all the people in each area happy. But let's start with the Scrum Masters and Program Managers um, just to verify why they were unhappy first. Um, so the thing is that user story looking in our backlog were actually created with just the title. And this is due to many different reasons. This is because we lacked a lot of backlog refinement meetings. Um, description was not accurate uh, because, again, maybe given the team was growing so fast, we needed to deliver way faster. Uh, so whenever we found out something like technical depth or new features, we were so busy in doing the actual development that we lacked and we forgot about writing things correctly in the backlog. Uh, but then the next time you were going to um, 
do the actual work that you planned previously, uh, you never know what to do because uh, with just a title, you didn't have enough context to actually perform any work regarding that. So we were removing ba uh, bugs or um, features, user story in general, uh, without any implementation because we forgot how and what we needed to achieve. And this is um, uh, due to, again, different reasons, like I was mentioning, um, but there are also different solutions. If you look at the process by itself, you need to talk with Scrum Master and with your product owner in order to fix it immediately because um, you need to set up backward refinement meetings and do all these kind of things. Uh, but if you look at the tool, like I mentioned, in Azure DevOps, you can create custom fields and custom validation rules. Um, so in this case, you can see I created some rules. So when I move something in progress, in the state in progress, I want also to make required the effort, the acceptance criteria, and the assigned to field. And this was mandatory. So um, not just with the state in progress, but with all the states. Um, so as you can see, um, when you were about to change the state and something was not ready to be taken um, in, in development, uh, then all the fields became required. And if developers didn't know what to do in, that, uh, in those specific fields, then the work was not starting. And this was kind of cool at the beginning, but again, it's all a matter about uh, the process. Um, and then we said, okay, um, let's say that for user story, this is done, but what about bugs? And the thing is that it was really hard to identify high priority issues, items that needed to be taken first. Um, so we said, okay, again, please talk with your Scrum Master, talk with the product owner, identify the priority and create a prioritized backlog. So this is part of the process, but if you want to use the tool, in Azure DevOps, we have the possibility to change and apply custom styling rules. Um, this can be done directly from your backlog. Uh, you can click on styles and you will see how to apply rules. So in this case, as you can see from the screenshot, I'm saying, for example, that uh, every single work item that is uh, at least uh, that hasn't changed since five days or more, then it's stale. So the background of the card will be turned into red. Um, of course, this is kind of cool, but please use it wisely. And that's because you may have colorblinded people in your team or on the other scenario, if you use too many colors, these will lose all, uh, they will lose all the context. So it will not mean anything. Um, so be, be very careful when implementing these, these kind of rules. Um, this is not it regarding the backlog. So we needed to work also uh, a little bit on the states. And why is that? Well, usually team members forgot to change the work item states. So when I was taking something and I was doing some development, uh, I knew what uh, I needed to do. So I started working immediately on it without changing the state to commitment or dev in progress or whatever. And then somebody else in the backlog, given the team was so big, and growing this fast uh, was taking the same user story. So we had two people working on on the same user story, um, but they were not talking to each other. So sometimes we had some unhappy moments uh, when creating pull requests. Um, and of course, you can imagine Scrum Master's product owner always upset uh, because it was really hard to predict when the work could be completed or not. Um, and then we decided again, first, let's try to add all the missing um, work item states that we need. Again, talk with your Scrum Masters to talk to the product owner in order to fix it. Um, but of course, this is a matter of having lazy developers probably, or developers that are not trained enough. Um, so again, talk with your developers, uh, try to fix it. But if not, and you want to use the tool, then Azure DevOps has, again, all the APIs that you need. So uh, what we did, for example, in this case, we said, okay, we want to know if the work is almost done, meaning there is a pull request pending, or if the pull request is merged and is ready to be pushed in the development uh, environment, for example. So we used a combination of REST APIs 
uh, to change the state of work items that are associated to my changes. Um, and of course, in the pipeline, we triggered those and we triggered the change based on the state. Um, and we used also custom conditions. So the change pen, uh, to state pending PR approval was getting triggered only when the build variable build.reason um, was set to pull requests, or otherwise we changed it to PR approved only when the build reason variable was set to individual CI or batched CI, meaning that the pull request was merged and the CI build was starting. Again, I don't think the important piece here is to understand how to do it and to do some copy and paste, and that's why you are not seeing any code, but it's just a matter of identifying uh, the process. So whatever best works for you, then take it and start implementing it. Azure DevOps will support it. Another thing we had was about querying work items because we needed to identify for example, products that were related, uh, sorry, work items that were related to the product itself and customization that we were doing to customers. And this also, um, this is not all the story because uh, we were not releasing fast enough, maybe once every three months, every six months or something like that. So we wanted also to calculate release notes. And it was really hard because we did a lot of things in between and it was really hard to correlate all these things. Um, so we said, okay, let's try again to mix uh, and create different work item types and then work with queries and try to make sure that we are able to link work items, um, have the correct work items type listed in our query, and then we will be able to generate reports automatically. And that is what we did. Again, it's a matter of process. Um, so I think that from the first part, which is um, understanding what you need to do um, and before starting development is quite done. This is what we did in the past three years. Of course, this is not all. Uh, this is just the beginning and the um, biggest pain point that we had. Uh, so we try to address that uh, in this way. But then of course there is development. Um, so regarding development, the first thing that we did was uh, enabling branch policies because we all um, started pushing everything into the master branch, but we, we didn't want that. Sometimes we were creating customization and customization were not about we pushed in the main product. Um, and so we said, okay, let's try to enable branch policies that are a way to protect from uncommitted, uh, sorry, from unwanted commits. And in this way, they are forcing you to create pull requests. Um, so in this case, you need to have some sort of validation. You need an approval from someone from your team or from specific members outside of your teams, like business, like stakeholders, and so on. Um, and you have full traceability because you can force, for example, work items to be linked in your pull requests. And of course, this can be bypassed if really necessary, uh, if you know what I mean because you need to be uh, really wise and careful when setting these branch policies. You want to ensure that the product that you're building and the changes that you're doing are actually correct and can be merged, uh, but you don't need to apply too many um, locking there because otherwise it will take so much time to get things merged and you will probably not even ensure high quality in the end. Um, of course, policy can be bypassed, or you can also have um, optional policies. Uh, optional policies are not policies that will block your request to get merged, uh, but actually if you have some um, uh, required policies, you can bypass them anyway. So you can do that, uh, for example, in a case where you have a build agent that is creating a new pull request uh, because, for example, you are updating a NuGet package automatically due to security reasons, uh, and you want things to get merged, even if not all the policies are um, are okay with it, and you want to do it as soon as possible. So you can do that, but you need to be very careful on where to apply those security uh, permissions. Of course, you can do that not only using security in um, in, uh, in Azure DevOps, but you can use also the Azure CLI, 
which is um, another CLI based on the Azure CLI, where you can automate most of the things related to Azure DevOps, including the boards, repos, pipelines, artifacts, and so on. But if there is something that it's not there, you can always use AZ REST's command uh, based from the Azure CLI. So you can automate really all the thing. And I think the best of it is to make sure you can trigger that CLI from, um, for example, an Azure function written in PowerShell, because you can do that. And you can use the Azure function to um, as a custom policy in Azure DevOps. In the end, this is just a webhook that you are calling whenever you create a pull request. So the webhook will be called, you will validate, you will call the Azure CLI, you will do your business logic there, and then you will post the status back to Azure DevOps saying, hey, this policy is passing or not. Of course, you can do other things. So uh, you can create a Node.js backend or something like that. But I think the, the power here is to use um, the Azure CLI and PowerShell based Azure functions. But then, of course, um, there are other things related to development, you know. And I think, as you remember from uh, the sad story that I told at the very beginning, um, versioning is quite complicated. Uh, we totally forgot how to version things. And this was one of the major issues that we had initially. So why is that complicated? Well, of course, you need to deal with different kinds of versioning. The first one is related to API versioning. And then you have versioning of the DLLs that maybe the same or maybe not. And then you have to identify the business or product versioning. So how many numbers should I use? Um, it's it's really complicated. <laughs> I think you get that. Um, naming is complicated as well. Uh, I think you all agree that Microsoft isn't really good at naming things because you probably remember Windows service packs or there is an actual product called Exchange Server 2010 update rollup 27 with service pack 3. Um, I was amazed in seeing this, but it actually exists. So uh, I think you understand why versioning is complicated, right? Um, and then, of course, you need to think about what you're actually building. So do you need NuGet packages? Should NuGet packages be versioned in a different way? Uh, what about the assembly version? Uh, this is not really supporting semantic versioning. Are there what can be considered a breaking change? Is there really a solution? Uh, to that? Probably not. Um, and we were using semantic versioning, so we decided to based on that. But I will not tell you that semantic versioning is the answer. But I will encourage you to go to look at the guidelines uh, so that you can, uh, that Microsoft created, so that you can start from there and do your thinking and then take whatever you think it's best for your project. What we did is starting our uh, development journey uh, based on Git flow and Git version. Actually, we are switching to GitHub flow just to keep the main branch and feature branches. Um, but what we did and what we have right now, uh, it's uh, Git flow. Um, and that's due to a um, very simple reason. We are merging things into develop, which is a kind of safe environment. And then using Git version, you are able to uh, calculate the version number automatically using SEM versioning. Um, how do I do that? Well, it's pretty easy. You simply install some extensions from uh, the marketplace that are quite uh, that are free, actually. So one is called Git version. Uh, and if you add this task into your pipeline, it will automatically generate uh, environment variables called Git version dot something. Um, that you can use to sign your assemblies. So there is another task you can use, for example, in this case, assembly info.net core, uh, which can sign your, um, your assemblies, your CS project, and whatever you need. So I think this is pretty neat and also quite straightforward if you want to get started, but you have no idea on what to do. So please take a look at what Git flow is, what Git version is about, and Git version actually works with GitHub flow if you want to use that and simply take the, the main branch there. Um, but of course, things are not only about development and writing features, but it's also about security. So we were releasing a product, but we had no idea what security was about. Um, but we said, okay, let's start from third-party dependencies. 
And if you look at what you have in Azure DevOps, you can uh, start integrating tools like White Source Bolt, which is free, um, or at least has a free version, um, which is probably better. And but this is limited for uh, to five scans per day on both private and public repositories. I think this is a good way to get started with security because again, you take an extension for free from the marketplace, you add it very easily in less than five minutes to your pipelines, and it will tell you immediately uh, with a good report whether what is your vulnerability score, what are the vulnerable libraries that you found, and so on. This is a good starting point uh, if you want to start tracing these things. But I think the best part is that for your real managers, uh, you can actually generate PDF reports uh, with all the vulnerability score and also suggestions. So there is a real good summary generated out of white source. And there is also associated CVEs and potentially a fix on how to resolve it because these are tied to some version numbers uh, of the package that you have. So here you can take some actions like doing manual changes and saying, hey, I need to change from version one to version two and plan some work into the backlog and so on. Or if you are really smart, I think the best is to create another pipeline that is capable of parsing this report and uh, doing the changes automatically in Azure DevOps because you have access via the CLI or the Azure uh, REST API. Uh, to your repository. So you can parse the repository the same way um, White Source Bull just did. You can identify the same version and change the version number using the suggested fix uh, from White Source. And then you can create a pull request. And if you're able to bypass policies, you can also merge things automatically. So, you know, this is an entire process end to end, completely automated, that will give you uh, the very basics of security, even if you have no idea on where to start on about security. So. Uh, this is really, really recommended. Uh, of course, you need to talk also about containers. So there is also Aqua Scanner or anything else that you may find in the uh, in the marketplace. This is also easy to get started because it has a free plan, but uh, it also has a paper scan, CSP program, and so on. Um, I think you all know that in Europe we have GDPR and so on. So probably it's better to take a look at all these things. But then uh, development is done. Of course, there are many other things I would like to talk about, but we are limited to 45 minutes, so bear with me. Um, product manager, they are responsible for release and delivery process. Um, so I will not uh, show you the entire pipeline uh, that we have because it's quite complicated and probably you will not even interested in it. But I want to talk to you about the bottleneck that we had in our release because everything is now automated, but SQL was really painful. Um, so what we did is that, and what we're doing today is that we create a replica of an Azure SQL database. Uh, we try to update the schema. And then if the schema update is successful, then we simply swap the replica with the main SQL database. And that's it. If there is a failure, then we try to involve the team. So the process is really automated 99% of the time. But if there are breaking changes into the SQL schema, then we try to involve the team. And that's because data is really uh, something we care about uh, to our customers because we have plenty of Power BI reports that we need to display. And given uh, uh, given that we would like to be sure what we need to roll out to customers, you know. So yeah, this is what I wanted to show you about that. And then I would like to talk to you about stakeholders because they are really interested in feedback and monitoring. So the product is delivered, but they need to talk with customers to understand if they are satisfied or not. So when you talk about feedback and monitoring, you're probably thinking about telemetry which is good because you need to understand how the thing is behaving. Uh, but this is a way to um, understand how the product behaves, but in a very later stage. I mean, you probably need to trace some things down. This is a passive monitoring system. So we want to be proactive. Uh, I want to understand first how the product is behaving before releasing it. And I can do that using two different systems. The first one is fault injection, which is really complicated because I'm assuming, for example, that 
I don't know, my SQL database is not responding. My APIs are not responding. So I'm testing recovery uh, pipelines to understand if, for example, another SQL DB can be created on demand and if I can guarantee 99% uptime and something like that. But testing in production is really another thing which is way easier to implement and I will show you that uh, in a second. But before talking about that, I think I need to talk about the other bottleneck that we had because we created the release process where we were simply taking the package of our web APIs and pushing that into app services in Azure. Uh, but we had approvals. And why is that? Well, uh, basically business wanted to tell us if we could have deployed the solution to that specific customer. So we were um, quite sure that um, the product was working, but actually it doesn't really uh, relate to product quality. So we said, why is that? This is really blocking us to deploy faster and multiple times a day because approvals were coming something like once every 15 days. So it was really not manageable. What uh, did we? Um, well, we started thinking about using release gates. So first, uh, we wanted to apply metrics to ensure we are ready to release. So we started measuring and and uh, seeing, hey, do we have any bugs reported in, uh, in Azure DevOps in our backlog? Um, is um, Application Insight reporting any issue in the environment that we deployed for testing? Um, or do we need any external approval and so on? This, of course, was great with approval, but this is another way to understand if you can deploy because you start adding quality into the process, you know? Uh, and of course, you can add also metrics from uh, uh, the Net Promoter Index, uh, KPIs, change management tickets using ServiceNow or any other tools. You can create custom ones. So you have plenty of possibility uh, to, to improve the product. Uh, so we started using that. And how does release gates work? Well, it's a time-based sampling. Um, so Let's assume every five minutes, Azure DevOps is doing a check against, for example, your backlog, our application inside queries, and so on. And it will tell you, hey, the gate is passing or not. After, I don't know, five times that all the gates are passing, then the deployment can continue. Otherwise, the deployment will stop. So it's pretty straightforward, I guess. And we combined that with partial rollouts because again, approvals and release gates were not telling me anything about what was going on in that environment. Was the product working? Were the features that I was releasing working? So we said, okay, what do we do? Well, we are releasing in Azure. So of course we can use the Azure CLI and uh, use stages in my release management pipeline in Azure DevOps to route the traffic to the new stage. So we are using A-B testing basically to roll out the new product version to customers. So um, basically we had a production environment and a new deployment slot that we can assume it was the newer production environment, the version two of our product. Uh, but 99% of the customer were reaching out to the real product and then the 1% of the customer were reaching the V2 of the product. And then we were increasing that number from 1% to 10% and from 10% to 20, from 20 to 50. And then if everything is working, then we flipped from 50 to 100%. And then in this case, it means that the entire traffic were going to V2, to the second version of the product. And then it means that the ro rollout is completed. But in this case, you are not using any approvals but you're using quality to measure if you can release it or not. So you can have faster deployments and everything can be automated. And you know what? If Application Insight is starting to um, give you some numbers um, saying that, hey, you are hitting some issues in these specific endpoints, you can stop the rollout or maybe uh, even do a rollback to the previous version if needed and everything can be 100% automated. Here I'm using release management, but you can also use um, the new YAML pipelines that Azure DevOps provides. So I think this really works great. 
in the end, before closing, I would like to talk about real managers. Um, because, of course, I think what I showed is what helped us achieving more uh, and what made our um, Scrum Masters, Product Owner, stakeholders happy. But of course, you need to make higher managers happy as well. Um, but what do they need? Well, I think, and that's why you see a unicorn there, uh, what they're asking for most of the time is something that does not exist. Um, and I would say probably most of the things they are asking is time and budget, you know, which is something quite complicated to get every single time. Um, and of course, they need resources, also known as people, um, which is quite important as well, because I think naming is quite uh, important, will make the difference on your team. Um, but in the end, what they really need is dashboard to understand what's happening. So um, first, we did some dashboards um, using all the queries that we created before. So if you go in Azure DevOps, you click on dashboard, you can create your custom one. You can also create extensions, custom extensions with custom dashboard, and you can implement those dashboard in. Or you can also create Power BI reports and embed your own Power BI reports that are maybe using Azure REST API um, inside Azure DevOps. So you can really do some magic things here. So the same queries that we created earlier in the backlog, making our Scrum Masters happy, are basically reported here as well with a summary and some cool graphs so that managers can really understand what is going on. And then probably this is not really manager style, but we wanted to do that anyway. So we created some build analytics. Well, this is something Azure DevOps is providing you out of the box, but you can import it again in Power BI and do your own uh, calculations. Um, but this, even if it may not sound something like managers are interested in, you need to consider that it helps identify in bottlenecks. So for example, you know that every time you trigger a pipeline, then you're probably associating that pipeline with one or multiple agents. And each agent has some costs. Um, so you probably are limiting the number of parallel agents or parallel jobs that can run. And these can increase the queue. Um, so longer the wait time, uh, probably less deployment per day you are doing. Uh, so I think this really helps identifying any bottlenecks that you may have in releasing the product faster. And also the costs, again, involved, because you may need more agents, and more agents are costly. Then we created something regarding test analytics, because again, um, testing part is really important. We want to ensure that every single release uh, is with higher quality. Uh, but we're not running all the test suites that we have every single time. We're just running all the tests that are impacted by the changes that we're doing. So that, again, we can save some time in our agents, in our pipeline. And this also helps identifying maybe flaky tests. The tests are passing uh, one time and the other are failing, and then they're passing again and so on. Uh, so please be careful. These are all power, um, powerful things. Uh, but I think creating reports out of that would be uh, really great for your managers. But if this is not enough, of course, you can create your own custom dashboard. So what we did, for example, uh, was uh, another website because we deployed the same product to multiple customers. But sometimes it was hard to understand which customer had which version of our product and which customization that we did. So we created the uh, ASP.NET project, and we were using Azure DevOps REST APIs to query all the releases that we did in our release management process, and we created this custom dashboard. And then we embedded the same uh, page within the Azure DevOps dashboard that you saw before. Um, so everything was within the product. And again, I already mentioned it, Power BI, of course, you can take uh, all the data that you need in Power BI and analyze it. I would like to highlight that there is um, in GitHub, um, this flow with uh, chart uh, created for Power BI. That is really cool. Um, so you can uh, take this one uh, and already link it with Azure DevOps and you will have uh, several pages with data and graphs already built in. Um, last thing is regarding documentation. Uh, so you remember that documentation is really hard to get because we were releasing uh, too late, it was hard to relate work items. Uh, but 
I think I don't have any answer. I don't have, uh, I haven't found anything that really helped us. Um, and I'm not sure I can suggest you anything, but um, I would recommend to really analyze your process first, then understand what you need to do. For example, in our case, to create release notes automatically, um, we are querying Azure DevOps pull requests that are merged uh, in the last, I don't know, month or something like that, or between two different tags. And then we are uh, creating markdown reports and we are publishing the same markdown um, in, uh, in the Azure DevOps Wiki completely automatically every time we do a release using release management. Uh, but again, it really depends on the process that you have. So in the end, I would like to say that you need to fail like I did because the sooner you fail, the sooner you will learn and the sooner you will also automate all the things that you need. And with that said, please do not forget to add unicorns and colors to all the reports that you're doing to your manager, of course, in PDF or in Excel or in PowerPoint because they will not get it otherwise. Um, so this is me. I would be more than happy to continue the conversation answering questions either here or on uh, Twitter or on LinkedIn or via email as well. You have all the contacts here. So I think uh, this is it for me. So 